Hi everyone, I'm Timothy Milovanov. We'll be starting shortly. We are waiting for Professor McFall to, to connect. Thank you. Yeah, they, they got got confused um, with the links, um, but they're reconnecting right now. So we're gonna, we, I expect to start in a, two, three minutes. Now it's amazing we have, uh, I'm gonna switch the video on. I'm in Ukraine. Timothy Brick is in Ukraine. So it's amazing actually <laughs> in many ways. So the economy is running here. Not ever Kiev. Uh, Timothy, you're in Kiev, right? Yes, thank you everyone for connecting. I am in Kyiv right now in the city center. I was uh, walking around the neighborhood, shaking. Um, the city stands strong. Mm -hmm. A lot of, uh, you know, military people around, but it looks safe. And um, I was doing groceries. So the life uh, goes on. Yeah, just to bring the sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have a friend. She's a dan dancer. She's a teacher. She dances kizomba, and you know, I've known her for I don't know how many years, 10, 15. And, and she's in Kiev, and she called me today and said, "Listen, you know, I just had a croissant and coffee." I'm like, "Where in Kiev? Where?" At the coffee shop at the gas station, um, and so they, you know, they're making croissants. <laughs> um, oh, I had croissant yesterday. Yeah, so um, people are working. I think it's um, there are some brave efforts of those people who work in service and uh, you know in groceries. Um, people in lines are quite disciplined as well. I was quite lucky. I I went to. Uh, to New York last year, I was a visiting researcher during the pandemic. So I was waiting in lines there. And I have to say that the lines here are quite the same. Oh, uh, Professor McFall is here. Uh, sorry for confusion with the links. No, it's my fault. All right. So, uh, Tim, you're going to uh, introduce us, and then Ambassador and I will just start the conversation. 
right? And the plan is go what uh, a little bit of talking and then Q and A if there are some, right? About an hour maybe, an hour thirty minutes between sixty and ninety minutes. Uh, we'll try to be closer to an hour. Sure. I have a I have a TV hit at ten o'clock, so I have to jump yeah. off right before. Okay, that. okay. So we have one hour. Good. So and then right. I stay and do Q and A. Okay. Uh, after yeah. additional, but we'll start Q and A early. So Timothy, go ahead. So technically, we have 50 minutes. Uh, my name is Timothy Brick. I'm a sociologist. I work at Kyiv School of Economics, and I am present in Kyiv right now. And this is a series of lectures of world leading intellectuals to support Ukraine, uh, you know, to show the solidarity. And we target our students, staff, but also a broader audience of Ukrainians and those who can join. Uh, well, I will um, save time uh, on making short introductions. I, I think. Uh, Professor McFall is very well known in Ukraine and around the world. Uh, he served mm -hmm. as an ambassador to Russia. He is a director of center at Stanford. Mm -hmm. He studies international relationships and politics. And he will be talking with uh, Timofey Milovanov, who is the head, he is the president of Kyiv School of Economics. He's also a professor at Pittsburgh. He published in top five econ journals, but he is also quite actively involved in Ukrainian administration. He is advisor to the presidential administration, and he used to be the minister of economy and agriculture. So please, uh, the floor is yours, Timothy, um, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And um, I've had the pleasure to speaking with you occasionally. Uh, and it's always been enlightening. So I'm gonna uh, go straight to it, you know. Uh, and we're speaking English, right? Not Russian. English is good, yeah. English is good. Uh, Everybody speaks English, we, great. We have been a little bit uh, thinking about maybe switching to Russian later, you know, as they say, you know, in a couple of weeks in these events. Okay. Greek, for example, was a, that would hit a different audience, but uh, currently we're doing international Ukrainian. And then- Okay, so the, I don't know. I'm go, I'm going to ask a couple of questions just because we're really interested in your perspectives, and then maybe you can ask me questions too, and then we'll do Q and A. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, one question, you know, all the questions are on the surface, but uh, I want to start with this one. Do you think realistically the invasion could have been avoided in in a, in a pragmatic sense? You know, not had we done something differently 15 years ago or 10 years ago? Had sanctions? Had Crimea been? Different? But in you know within the last year or two, could have realistically politics, diplomacy, econ economic sanctions of what not, you know, investment projects, could have something been done to prevent that? It's a great question. You know, these are what we call counterfactuals in political science, right? Um, you know, my gut answer is no, because at the, if you get to the essence of what drives Putin uh, with respect to Ukraine, and I would say with respect to the, the entire world, um, his goal and his, well, his frustration even a year ago with Ukraine was that you had not submitted uh, to his influence, that your democracy was still working, uh, that your economy hadn't collapsed, uh, remember, he thought after invading in 2014 uh, that that would be disruptive enough, that that would create volatility, uh, that that would create doubt um, amongst your population and your elite about the future of Ukraine. And uh, let's be honest, it, it did for a while among some, at least that's my perception. And, you know, I interact with a lot of Ukrainians, uh, just so people know here, um, we at Stanford have a, a been trained have a training programs for ukrainians for about 15 years well we started our first fellow came in uh 2005 uh so we've had hundreds of people that we interact with um we hosted president Zelensky. i hosted president Zelensky in august for the first uh, visit from a ukrainian president to california ever it was a great honor that i had to have him here in august um we had your former uh, prime minister, Goncharuk, was a fellow of ours last uh, fall. And, um, and I'm saying all that because I've heard the debates earlier. Uh, well, if we can't, you know, if, if the, United, the United States won't support NATO membership and the, US, the NATO won't support it, maybe we have to hedge our bets and figure out a way to, to make peace with Putin. Uh, and there were some that thought that, including even President Zelensky, by the way, in the beginning. But um, uh, so he was achieving some goals, Putin was, 
But but at the end of the day, the revolution of dignity did not collapse and was was successful um, uh, in making in, in, in helping to consolidate democracy and and a you know a European country, and that's what Putin seeks to destroy right now. So, except for you know, uh, you know, I can think of a real counterfactual would be you know. Yanukovych comes back and everybody says, hey, we were sorry about 2014. And no, we don't actually want to be a free country. We just want to be, you know, a colony of Russia again. Well, then there would have been no war. But that's that's ridiculous. Right. And and in, in social sciences, counterfactuals have to be as close to reality as possible. That one is not close to reality. And I think that's very important. I, I think everybody on this call understands this, but not many people in my country understand it. But that's what he is rolling back. This was never about NATO membership, you know, all this kind of BS about, you know, if we just signed that, he would have not. Uh, he, 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 he always knew that Ukraine was not a military threat to Russia um, in terms of military. But the threat of Ukraine to Russia, of course, is Ukrainian democracy. Uh, and that's what he has been obsessed with, by the way, not just since 2014, all the way back to 2004, um, uh, he has been trying to undermine uh, Ukrainian democracy uh, for that entire time. And sometimes he's been successful. I want to, I think it's important to understand that that campaign at times has been successful. Um, Ukrainian democracy and, and, you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, economy, I'll, we'll switch over to, and I'll hear from you on that. I'm not an expert, but uh, is not as strong as it could have been if it were had a different neighborhood or a different regime in Russia, right? So that damage has been done for decades. But I think he finally just got frustrated and he said, uh, enough is enough. I'm going to do this drastic uh, act to try to finally roll back the revolution of dignity. And that's what he's doing now. So no diplomacy could have stopped that other than telling Ukrainians to stop wanting to be free. And that seems pretty ridiculous thing that uh, diplomats could ask of your citizens. Thank you. So a follow up question then is, uh, um, is you think, um, you know, a lot of people are saying that it's not going according to Putin's plan, but you know, what was his plan? We have no empirical evidence and this kind of analytics, I'm, I'm really honestly sick of it. You know, that's not falsifiable and we can explain anything. It's just uh, shows our biases and uh, preconceived notions, which are, you know, which then set, it up, set us up for constant surprises. Yes. So can we talk in any meaningful way about what we, given what we know now, given the new information that he actually dared enough to take this step, invade the country and start a war. What was his plan? And, you know, based on some symptoms or empirical patterns, you know, Chechnya, Grozny, Crimea, Belarus, Kazakhstan, you know, he, it's not, he's not new to use, use of force, right? In right. The, the greens. Uh, right. And so what was his potential plan? Clearly it was something to do with Kiev, you know, uh, but, you know, and uh, is it going according to it or not? Yeah, well, that's a great question, actually, um, because emotionally, and me too, these are all, all, these are times of emotion, and rightfully so, by the way. I'm not afraid to be emotional about good and evil. This, this is a moment of good and evil and right and wrong. Um, uh, we frame things in a certain way, but you're asking me analytically uh, to talk about Putin's plan. I actually think what's happening right now is Putin's plan. Um, and maybe it's not going as fast as he wanted to, but I don't think there's been some major shift. Uh, he, he stated it very clearly in that, you know, that I listened to the whole speech, uh, probably the only one who did uh, before he invaded. Um, by the way, you know, I teach at Stanford and, and I listen to arguments from my students. And if you need 58 minutes to explain your argument, uh, that means you're confused about your argument. Uh, and he was definitely having a hard time uh, explaining to the Russian people why he was invading Ukraine. It was, it was very clear to me. And I encourage 
No, I don't encourage you to listen to it. It's too painful. Just take my word for it. Um, uh, that was not the, the a speech given by a strong and confident president. And, and talking to one of my Russian friends who used to work in the government uh, and knows Putin well, uh, he said to me, you know, this obviously was his own speech. His speech writers didn't write it. They didn't tighten it up. Um, you know, that it's, it's bad uh, staff work that he went and did that speech. But in that speech, he talks about two things, destroying the Ukrainian military and destroy and denazification. Um, and denazification is a code word for regime change. I mean, that's what he wants to do. Uh, that's what he intends to do. Um, and, you know, before in my country, in the United States, there was lots of debates about you know, first of all, many people incredibly naively, in my view, were saying that he would never invade. Uh, then there was a group that said, oh, he would just take the two uh, people's republics and make them and, and, you know, annex them. Then there was this giant conversation about the land bridge, right, Nova um, and and all of those more minimal thing objectives he's not doing, obviously. He's got a maximalist position that he is not, uh, uh, he's not uh, diverted from. And I think he plans to, you know, destroy the Ukrainian military. Emphasize, he plans, it doesn't mean he will. Those are, I want to get back to that in a minute, but the, that's his plan. And then install uh, a new regime, a new government uh, in Kiev, either with Zelensky uh, gone or arrested or killed. So that's his plan. Um, I want to say personally, I think it's a incredibly flawed plan. Uh, I don't, the, I don't really understand the end game um, because you know um, Ukraine is a, 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 as you all know, Ukraine is a giant country, more than forty million people. Um, uh, he does not have the military resources that Stalin had when he tried when he imposed people's republics throughout the war, uh, Eastern Europe after World War II. He does not have the Red Army uh, occupying um, uh, your country. And I don't see that he has the capability. I don't think he has the resources to achieve the goal that he set out. And by the way, many Russians agree with me. Um, and so, and even if he does achieve temporary occupation of, of Kiev and the other major Kharkiv and other cities, then what? Uh, it's clear to me that Ukrainians will never submit to a Russian puppet regime. Uh, and there's no ideological argument here either. I think that's really important to understand. You know, Stalin had a, an argument uh, that we were, they were spreading communism and he had communist party puppets. Um, what's Medvedchuk going to say? What's Yanukovych going to say? You know, or some other like ridiculous person. Uh, by what argument will they say they will be in power and i just don't i honestly cannot understand uh putin's end game uh i i've known putin for a long time i met him in 1991 i've been writing about him for a long time for five years in the government uh, i sat in the room with him uh, many times uh, by the way he really hates me uh he made that clear to me personally in an, a couple of meetings um, so I, I want to I want to just say that because maybe that makes me biased in terms of the way I analyze what he's doing, that that the vitriol that he has for me. Uh, but I don't I don't think he has an end game. And and I think you know to those other wars. Thank you for bringing those up. I think it's very important to understand how we got here by looking at those other wars. So people need to remember that this is Putin's fifth war. It's not his first war. Chechnya 1999, Georgia 2008, Ukraine 2014, Syria 2015. Um, and from his perspective, he won all those wars. Um, and, and, then, and that, I think, emboldened him to think that he could win a fifth war. Um, now, this war is an order of magnitude bigger challenge than those other four wars. Let's be clear about that. But, but this happens with leaders when they're in power. You know, I study dictatorships and how they fall as an academic professionally. That's what I teach. And uh, there's a clear pattern in the world of, of people that leaders that are in power for too long. They begin, they have some victories, 
uh, they begin to believe their own propaganda, and then they overreach, right? That's the story of Brezhnev. Uh, that's exactly what Brezhnev, what happened with him. So if you remember, uh, in the 70s, uh, this great Soviet phrase, correlation of forces, right? Uh, the correlation of forces felt like it was on the communist side and against uh, the Western world. Uh, you had communist victories in Vietnam, Laos, uh, Cambodia, then Angola, then Mozambique, then Nicaragua. And it, you know, it looked like Brezhnev was on a run. He was winning all these, all these regime change efforts and, and you know, supported by military force. And that's when he decided to invade Afghanistan. And if you look at the writings on that, he thought this was gonna be a cakewalk. It's gonna be easy. Uh, Afghanistan would just become the 16th Republic, you know, just like Uzbekistan and uh, uh, the other stands out there. Um, they clearly did not understand uh, the internal situation in Afghanistan. Um, and we all know how that war ended, right? That war was one of the precipitants to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that, so I think this is very similar to that, that he, he was on a roll, he overreached, he didn't understand uh, the situation inside Ukraine, maybe because he was believing his own propaganda, maybe because his Siloviki, you know, those guys around him were feeding him uh, information about how the Ukrainian army would never fight, uh, Zelensky would flee, uh, and this could all be over in a matter of weeks. Uh, I don't, that's my speculation. I don't know that. I do know um, that he does live in an information vacuum. Uh, he does not, he, you know, he doesn't watch television, you know, he doesn't watch independent television or news. He's not on the internet. He, he really strongly believes in secret information. And, um, and by the way, I, I understand that. I've worked in the government for five years. When you get a popki, when you get a, you know, one of those red secret uh, popki, that, 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 those folders that says this is top secret information that we have, we have obtained in a, in a specific, specific way. Um, you know, it doesn't come from Ukrainska Pravda. It comes from our, you know, our agents in Ukraine. Um, it has that feel like it's really uh, real, right? And better information. But those guys around him, they're the ones that feed him that. And I think that has, uh, that contributed to his miscalculation about, um, about this war. So I, I see a lot of parallels to other dictators. You know, Milosevic is another one where they're just in power too long. They think they can do anything and then they overreach and then ultimately it leads to their own destruction. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question which is maybe not pleasant, uh, not to you, but to me. Um, did Ukraine have a plan? So, you know, we're now talking about plan of Putin and maybe there are miscalculations, but everything more or less, you know, you know it's clear that he had a plan and he's pushing along this plan. It might or might not be working or it's been stalled, you know, it might or might not work out. Ukraine doesn't seem, you know, or at least has not talked about the plan. Did it have a plan? And if it didn't, does it have a plan now? Or what is it doing? How is it able to resist? And what's the, where is the resilience coming from? Um, because just, you know, three days before the invasion, I read an article in New York Times about how delusional uh, Zelensky is and how he is a comedian without an uh, inexperienced politician. And if, God forbid, something happens, everything will collapse just because he, he hasn't got it in him. Uh, and that was so far from the truth uh one can only imagine again that's that type of analysis that we're saying what everyone seems to be believing it's like group group think or group say yes. uh, but you know did did ukraine have a plan and uh, does it have it now and what it is and where is the re resilience coming from well i think that's an excellent question for you to answer you know better than i <laughs> what's your answer professor milovanas oh that that's unexpected but um Zelensky is really underappreciated. So if you look at this, there is a pattern. It's not that he just came out of nowhere a warrior. I, I, you know, I served as a minister under him. I served as a deputy chairman of the Council of the National Bank under, uh, under Poroshenko. And I also served as an advisor. I came back as an advisor to serve uh, after some, some uh, some pause 
And when I was an advisor, it was the winter of 2020, 2021. So it was about a year ago, last winter. The win January started from the pro-Russian party, Medvedchuk party, hiking up utilities and orchestrating public protests. So it, it from you know from outside you don't see it. It looks like they blame right. the government, but from inside right. you actually see who is doing it, and you know the responsibility for that price increase is really at the uh, local companies which are controlled by politicians who are pro-Russian, and yet right. they are, in their strongholds they are organizing protests. Then we get the IMF pressure and everyone to actually continue to raise prices. And Delensky resists it. So he goes, you know, fighting with, uh, with the IMF and with everyone else. And I remember giving a lot of interviews saying that, you know, guys, you know, there's the reasons we have some rationale. But basically, his rationale was political. He says, you know, if we, if we, um, at that point, at least we perceived that it was just usual, usual oligarch pressure to discipline Zelensky. You know, I didn't think of it anymore. But I and now, in the hindsight, I think that was actually an attempt to destabilize or prepare for this. So the idea was that you know probably the IMF should have been successful, and you know the IMF was doing everything correctly according to their book. I'm not saying you know right. they also right. not, you know they're not they're an economic institution. They are not a policy. Yep. You know, defense, strategic right. communications, op institutions. So they they were played too, uh, and I actually have evidence on on smaller scale in 2014, 15 how the IMF has been played by Russia. So the idea, pro, you know, Zelensky says, I refuse to raise prices. Furthermore, I'm going to go after Medvedchuk, and those bows were very different from what Poroshenko would have done. Right. So Zelensky says, remember. If we increase prices now, I'll have to change the government. That's the story of Yatsenyuk. That's the story of Groisman. Right. Had he done that, had he changed the government, we would have been entering the war with an inexperienced, inexperienced prime minister and cabinet. That did not happen. And that's because Zelensky, whatever was his pressure on Schmigel, he actually protected Schmigel. And Schmigel himself, I remember in these meetings, was saying, you know, maybe we should come back, you know, and he says, man, you're going to be out of the office, at least you. That's just pure populist politics, you know, we cannot do that. Second, he went after Medvedchuk, and everyone was like, can we do it? You know, he put him under house arrest. Right. In a questionable manner. In a questionable right. manner. But right. he put him under, under house arrest. And everyone was like, these are two unexpected moves. Right. That's a game changer. And everyone was worried at that time that Putin will come back at this because Medvedchuk is, has, has been perceived as untouchable. And in fact, we got disruption in January and February. We really had disruption of diesel, gas, oil, electricity. We got disruption right away coming from Russia and from Belarus. Right. And remember this meeting with Zelensky, Zelensky saying, okay, let's go to other Russian companies. And everyone was, no, but this is Russian. He says, you know, we'll figure it out. It's one story if it's just Medvedchuk and his companies are boycotting us. It's completely another story. It's a fully Ru Russia, fully Putin now confronts us economically right away. So in some sense, it, it is as if he were testing, you know? Right, right. Right there he was testing. And so at that point, Putin didn't dare or didn't decide it. So we actually got supplies through other Russian companies. <laughs> okay, I can talk about this. I probably wouldn't have talked uh, anyway, uh, but we were dependent on them when we kept diversifying. Which companies, though? I'm, I'm curious, or if you can say, or maybe you can't say. Maybe no, better not to say. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another day, another day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe another year, and then we'll talk about yes. it. And then, yes. yeah, so there have been a number of episodes like that. A number of episodes. But remember in August, Shafir, you know, it's the group of three. Shafir, Yermak, and Zelensky. Shafir was assassinated. There was an assassination attempt. Yes, I remember. Okay, and there are multiple theories about this, from Russia to something else, that it was a signal. Right. Zelensky didn't budge at all. Did not budge at all. And right. two months later, we, start, we, we have the article in, in Wash Post. So there could be much more under this that has been, you know, continuous pressure and escalation and Zelensky has been responding. Right. 
in a very, you know, even under, after an assassination attempt on a person who is very close to him, he sort of, you know, they, they put him in, in security and, and, and things. And, you know, his driver was shot, wounded, you know. I know, I saw, right. So, so we kind of forget these little episodes. And I can give you another five, you know, but okay, let me just, but you, you get the gist of my thinking. Yeah. So probably there was a planet just, or at least he was, he, he knew what he was doing, I think, or where we are heading. And it's very different where his view has changed because he was different in 2019 when he came in the office. Okay. And, you know, I once I asked some, you know, top official and I also had my ideas about, you know, what's really happening. And he said, I think he tried in good faith to do several things. Right. With Russian prisoners exchange, ceasefire. Right. right. And he got screwed two or three times. And after that, he sort of changed his perspective. I don't know if it's true, but that's what people are saying, you know? Yes, that makes sense. So there is actually dynamic construction continuity under it. Uh, rather than, you know, it's just a big surprise. Right. Uh, but, okay, but that's, I guess, my response would be. So I still don't know what the plan is, but apparently there is something which gives right. you. Okay, so so we, we are actually at 7.30. Oh, okay, Kiev time. I'm so glad you gave an answer instead of me. That was a fantastic answer. Um, and I just, I don't know the details as well as you do, Professor, but um, uh, as an outside observer and somebody who interacts with the, the Biden administration frequently, and, you know, I'm part of, you, as you would imagine, circles of experts on Ukraine and generals, and every day we're discussing various things. And in the run up to the war, to the invasion, uh, there was lots of um, noise, I would say, in our system, in our media, just like you pointed out, talking about Zelensky, you know, not being serious. Um, and every time I, I said, you know, this is not a time, it's just not strategically wise. I don't care what you think privately about you know this decision or that decision and whether he's ready or not remember there's lots of debate about he was telling people to be calm when biden was saying the invasion's coming and some of the americans were saying well why is he doing that and i was saying he was doing that to to stabilize his economy and uh you know uh, there was to support his currency and and that's a very rational thing for him to say um, and then he was criticized in my country just, so you know, for flying to the Munich Security Conference as if, you know, there's this kind of paternalism that comes from uh, the United States towards many countries, but especially Ukraine, I, I want to say honestly, uh, that really bothers me. And I said, I, I'm on national TV every day, I, and I will be again in 20 minutes. Um, uh, I said, you know, who the hell are you to tell Zelensky? Uh, what flight to take or not. And when he said, I'll have breakfast in Kiev and I'll have my dinner in Kiev, I thought that was such a strong statement, like um, enough already uh, of us telling him what to do. This kind of, you know, the Ukrainians can never do the right thing kind of uh, the argument you have. And I wrote a piece, just so you know that I'm not making this up uh, post facto. I will send it to you. You can see it. I wrote a piece on the eve of his visit to President Biden. So his first meeting that he had with Biden. And I said, um, it's time for us to stop talking about what we are doing for Ukraine's security and start talking about what Ukraine is doing for our security. Because at the end of the day, Ukraine, this is before this invasion, right? This is last August. Who is fighting Putin? Who is, who is actually fighting Putin? Uh, it was Ukraine. It wasn't Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It wasn't Germany, France, or the United States. So this whole conception that, that we are helping uh, Ukraine with its security, I was trying to flip around and say, no, they, they are fighting for the free world now. And we should think about it as a mutual security relationship, not this paternalistic thing. And my whole argument for that was to give more weapons. Um, and I would say on the, on the counter, you know, the mistakes made, um, and it's easy to say now, but, but I think had we done more earlier on, um, particularly with air defense systems, right? 
So there are some weapon systems that that your that Ukraine doesn't have right now. The Patriot missile system, for instance, um, uh, the Iron Dome system from Israel, the Arrow system from Israel. These are these are very effective um, uh, air defense systems, uh, but they're really expensive and they're very complicated. They're not like a stinger where you just put it on your shoulder and shoot. They're pretty complicated systems, and um, you know, in my view. That and that, that, you know, military assistance, of course, was disrupted during the Trump era, and they were just kind of getting it back online uh, last year. But that I think if there's one thing that I, I regret that we didn't do, it was um, and, and MiG-29s, by the way, like, like, you know, by my count, we have 70 MiG-29s in the NATO alliance. Uh, Poland has most of them. Uh, in retrospect, we should have shipped all those planes uh, uh, before, uh, but that's one that's not that one that I still think is possible. And I'm doing everything I can uh, privately and publicly to push our government, to push the polls, to send those. Those, those are those are 27, uh, you know, planes. They're ready to fly. Ukraine has pilots that know how to fly them. Uh, so this is different than some of the other things where it's more complicated to ship them. Uh, they should be in the theater as soon as possible. I agree with this completely with everything from mix to air defense. I mean, they would, you know, combat wise, you know, ground forces. Obviously, you know, Ukraine is stronger or as strong, you know, in some areas, right? So combat yes. is not a real threat. Yes. And they have better tactic. Yes. The way they, they separate convoys, they wait to, you know, they assault convoys, then convoys can uh, fuel the tanks, then tanks run out, you know, then they you only need to wait for a little bit. They run out of uh, fuel. Once they immobilize, you can attack their sitting ducks. And, you know, that's why they actually, they know they're sitting ducks. That's why right. they're abandoning them. That's why we're seeing so many abandoned vehicles, because if they are not abandoned, then they just uh, uh, exterminated right there, you know, without. Right. Uh, so, so, you know, Okay, so but back to this paternalism. So here's an yes. I, I sometimes call it men's uh, Russian explaining, like men's explaining. It's always about what Putin wants, what Putin doesn't want. Yes. But it's, really, it's not about what it's about. It is about what capacity of resilience in in Ukraine is. It's about leadership. It's about what people want in Ukraine because otherwise it would have been another Belarus or something right now, you know. Uh, yes. And it would be completely under Russian control had it not been for. So really, in the end, the price could be very high, but it is determined by ukrainians okay right. so that that's uh, that is set aside last friday you know in the middle already you know half of you know several days in the war i give this panel you know together with some other people somewhere in north america you know a prestigious university a, a moderator is a top journalist uh, in a you know in in top regional journalist, uh, maybe not DC, but I don't want to, maybe DC, maybe top capital journalist, ask me the following question. Tell me how is it possible for Ukrainian government to operate now effectively? Because we know that uh, President Zelensky is in an undisclosed location right now, and he probably has difficulty connecting with uh, his prime minister. And you know, how does prime minister function when he cannot even talk regularly with the president? So there are at least three assumptions here. First assumption is that Zelensky is hiding somewhere, some, in some bunker, away from the government. Second one is that we don't have telecom and communications in Ukraine. It's like some, I don't know, some country which doesn't have, uh, you know, robust military communication between the president and the war cabinet. And third assumption is that we don't have war cabinet and we don't have uh protocols how they act if they don't have access you know to command you know if the president is not incommunicado for whatever reason three assumptions so that's all paternalistic assumptions and prejudiced assumptions but it's even more ridiculous because that night an hour or two before the panel Zelensky comes out with a selfie video where he's in front of his administration outside in the open next to the prime minister and says listen i'm not hiding anywhere here's my cabinet we're doing we're working it we're here the, you know we're we're fighting so the guy didn't even bother to check and he's the top political economy pundit and commentator in a country 
he didn't even bother to Google up the last the last video or something about, and he makes assumptions that the Zelensky is hiding there, doesn't have commit president for the you know, God's sake, president is standing next to prime minister 59 minutes before the panel. You know, it's online. So, you know, this is a pattern, a lot of assumptions. And uh, unfortunately, Ukraine has to fight and pay in lives for this. Because, you know, I remember someone asked me on the first day of war what's going to happen. And I said, you know, unfortunately, we have to survive these two or three days. If we do, then the West will see that we can fight because they don't believe we can right and then they will start being serious about him it's going to be a little bit too little a little bit too late as it has always been yes but they assume already that we're going to lose and so you know that is really painful to see so i'm frustrated about this um about these narratives but i think you know uh, we are showing by actions on the ground that things are different that yes, Russia, yes. we're not the same nation, that Ukrainian military and people are resilient and can get, you know, engage the largest military in the region, on the continent, perhaps. Well, China is a different continent. And, uh, you know, and we are going to persevere. Uh, but the price is really high. So, so I think that's my view. And I, I you know, I, I call on everyone to be a little bit serious don't don't you know don't be analytical <laughs> based you know study ukraine too not just russia because we got russia wrong anyway <laughs> we studied it and studied it and studied it and we got it wrong anyway so you know now maybe study ukraine because there is more data <laughs> at least we are more open so that would be my academic take on this i think we have well, let me let me say a couple to, things yeah. to what you said if i may because i yeah, think sure. you're saying some very important things and i want to just underscore and associate myself with them. Um, first, uh, we academics, right? So, so I have a, I have a portfolio of activities that I do, right? Um, uh, but, you know, my, my day job is a professor at Stanford University, one of the leading academic institutions in the world. And, and you should know that we made a big bet on Ukraine at the Institute I run very purposely. Uh, one, because we, and, and when I say we, I mean my colleagues at a, it's called the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. It's, it's a, one of the centers uh, of the institute I run, the Freeman Spogli Institute. Um, so we, uh, Larry Diamond, Frank Fukuyama, Catherine Stoner, uh, you know, long, 15 years ago, 20 years ago almost, made this, I, this idea that the future of democracy, because we all care about global democracy, the most important frontline state in the world in the fight for democracy, period, in the world is Ukraine. That was before this war. We've been saying that for years and years and years. So that's why we have these training programs and, and, and interactions and, you know, have visiting fellows like, you know, even people like Slava Varkarchuk spent a half a year with us. Uh, he sat in class, just so you know, he sat in Frank Fukuyama's class, Slava did, right next to my son. Uh, learning about the relationship between democracy development and rule of law. And he used to cheat from my son's notes when he couldn't understand the English. He, he would ask my son, call uh, to help him. Uh, and and I, I'm telling you that anecdote because, you know, we have sought, we have made a strategic decision to help, you know, decolonize uh, American thinking about your part of the world. But we haven't done enough, but we, we, I, I want to say is that, you know, it is incumbent upon us to do that. That's the first thing. Second, to your point um, about the ignorance of America, uh, it's why I feel I have to be on TV. I, I do tons of TV right now, speaking to common Americans, because it's my platform to try to explain a different uh, point of view, because you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm part of it. I want to be clear. Um, uh, you know, Soviet studies was dominated by people that studied Russia. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have all of these Russian studies centers all over the universities. And the word Ukraine uh, doesn't appear very often. You know, Harvard has a, a center on Ukraine. There are some others. But, but we've got to, we've, we academics for the long haul, we have to uh, really uh, rethink those assumptions. And, you know, we just had a panel here at Stanford on, uh, yesterday and one of our Ukrainian students, we have, you know, uh, probably two dozen students from Ukraine here, very bravely got up in front of 700 people and challenged them. Uh, 
uh, you know, very, you know, she, she listed a bunch of artists and writers and she said, now you all think they're Russians, but they're not, they're Ukrainians. Uh, I think she, you know, and, and she was very vocally challenging, uh, you know, uh, academia to rethink that. And I think, you know, in the long run, we have to, including with, with all of you, uh, we have to work together to try to do that. So I just, I just completely agree with uh, everything you just said. And on Zelensky, you know, he's just a badass. Uh, I think uh, he will go down in history, no matter how this ends, as one of the most courageous people we have ever seen this century. Um, uh, and, and when I get photos, you know, from people that are with him, I just did just a, yesterday, um, uh, we just, we should be humble about our previous wrong assumptions about him and courageous to do whatever we can to help him and all the Ukrainian people win this war. I know Ukraine's going to win this war. I, I, I will, I will predict that with a hundred percent certainty. I just don't know how long the war will be. So our goal now has to be to shorten the war uh, and including, you know, if it, if it turns into partisan war and, and, you know, those more tragic scenarios. But our mission statement has to be to do everything we can to shorten the, the length of either the conventional war or the partisan war that might come. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pitch also a perspective that we do actually have in our strategic documents of the Kiev School of Economics that the issue you just described about the Slavic centers, which are not really Slavic yes. centers, but Russian centers based on not empirical evidence. Yes. And yes. kind of conceptual notions. They're really not falsifiable. It's really written in our Kiev School of Economics strategic documents that we have to move this discussion towards empirical based evidence. Because you know you, you can't falsify the concept. You are sitting in the room and there are 17 out of 10 people believe that someone is threatened by something and they're four and they're more powerful. And you know, uh, you, you, you look, you know, it's it really, you have to challenge it. It has to be, it, it has to be scientific method. It cannot be just, I believe in this. You yes, know? I agree, I agree. So scientific method. The second one is, that's what I've been doing since 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, I'm fighting for, together with the Kiev School of Economics, for intellectual sovereignty of Ukraine as well. It's a part. We want to have a universities. We don't want to be an intellectual colony where, you know, whoever thinks about things, they want to go to Moscow to study at Moscow State University, or they want to go to Prague, you know. Yes, you know yes. the, one of our oldest universities, the Lviv University, which people say existed since the 12th or 16th century, you know, in different forms and shapes. The history of it, trying to fight to have the right to teach in Ukrainian, at least for three faculty members. And it was happening in the 19th century. And in the 20s, there were Soviets. So, you know, we have been a center of culture, center of geopolitics, center of a lot of things, of art, but of science. But we have not had universities which are regionally, intellectually prominent. We have to change that. And that I, I think there are at least three universities in Ukraine, Ukrainian Catholic University, Kiev Mohila University, and now Kiev School of Economics, which are capable to rise to the challenge after the war and during the war. So that's why I'm asking all academics to symbolically establish relationships with Ukrainian universities. It could be, you know, if, if Ukraine applies to the EU candidacy, so we apply for candidacy for dual programs, dual degrees, engagement. You know, we have 40 million people in Ukraine. Russia has 130. So we do have enough talent and with sufficient funding and much more clear identity, we will be able to be prominent. So that's what we are building. And so this, this series of lectures during the war is making this point too. And so I'm thank, I'm very grateful to you, Ambassador and Professor McFall, for being here with us. So we have five maybe minutes at most. There are yeah. several questions. Maybe Timothy, you, or Timothy Brick, you can read those questions, and then I'll pick up the questions from chat, and then we'll do uh, answer them like you know as a bunch, okay, as a bundle. Uh, okay, I will uh, read out some questions. So we have some in Q and A. Uh, Georgi Yegorov he asks a question about sanctions, and specifically he 
asks whether you agree that Western sanctions, harsher than expected, are not so much due to elite strong reaction to Putin actions, but rather due to the public pressure in the West. So uh, he wants to understand your perspective on that. Yeah. Uh, and another question is how likely is that Russia pushes the red button? I think this is what a lot, well, you have already, uh, you know, uh, and Timofey Milovanov talked that maybe he doesn't like discussing these speculative uh, ideas, but still there is a question, how likely that Russia pushes the red button? And there are other questions in the chat on our Facebook, so people are interested, you know, in the role of China, for instance. Um, and I think I'll stop here because these are three very big questions. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, first on sanctions, uh, there's no doubt that public pressure in the West, and most certainly in my country, is pushing the US government to do more. Uh, every single day, more and more comes, and I want you all to know that I'm, I am intimately involved in these campaigns. Um, my, my latest targets are uh, Visa and MasterCard. Uh, Visa and MasterCard should not be doing business in Russia today, and cutting them off uh, would have a, a giant effect on millions of Russians. And, and I, want, I want you to know, I've, I've, these are, I've been involved in some controversial stuff. I was very criticized by our progressive left a few days ago when I, I used the word, there are no innocents left in Russia. Uh, and I said, you're, you, this war is a black and white moment for Russians. Uh, you can't pretend that you're just a passive sitting on the sidelines and you have nothing to do with it. And that kind of passivity has, has created the permissive conditions for Putin's dictatorship for, for 20 years now. And these are friends of mine, by the way. So you guys know, I, I know very prominent people in Russia, uh, very prominent people that work for Putin. Uh, and, you know, they would always say to me, Mike, you know, you don't understand him. He's a transitional figure. We liberals, we, we have to grow the economy you know, so that, that we can have a, on a second democratic transition. I used to listen to those kind of arguments all the time when I was ambassador. Um, and, uh, you know, I've not been back to Russia. I'm on the sanctions list. So, you know, so I can't travel to Russia. I would not want to travel to Russia now. I'd be arrested. Uh, but, um, you know, I would listen to those arguments. You know, this guy, you, you might know this guy, Shuvalov in particular, Igor Shuvalov, Gref. Uh, Chubais, uh, these, these kind of characters like that, they, they would make these arguments with me. Um, and, you know, I would listen. It wasn't my job to tell them how to live their lives back in 2014. But now you can't, those arguments are completely illegitimate. And, and those three people that I just named, I hope they, you know, Naibul, and let's talk about here, Ksenia Yudayeva. I'm naming them on purpose, by the way. I think it's time to name people on purpose. Uh, you know, Shuvalov now runs a, a big bank. Um, uh, you know, these are people that that think in economic terms, uh, you know, they're liberals. Uh, I think they fundamentally believe in democracy, but they've made this deal with Putin that, you know, we'll take care of the economy in the hopes that, you know, things will be better in the future. Well, there's no future now. Uh, there's no bet with Putin. And so I think it's really incumbent upon uh, the West to continue sanctions, not just that punish targeted sanctions. That's the point. That's where I reverse my position from 2014. No, if the Russian people have to suffer, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but by paying taxes, you are funding Putin's war. You are no longer an innocent you know, bystander in this war. And then people say, oh, but, but Putin will arrest them. Well, give me a break, uh, you know, uh, com compared to what he's doing to your people, that is a small price to pay. And I would just remind people, you know, the last time pe pe people have not been killed in demonstrations in Russia for a long, long time. So I find that to be an excuse uh, um, uh, that, and therefore I support uh, wide sanctions. And I do think it's public pressure. Um, uh, the government is, is responding, they are not leading on sanctions. And I think anything one can do to, to keep that pressure on, we should continue to do. Uh, and I'm realizing I'm gonna have to leave in two minutes. So maybe- I, I'm gonna I'm going to just follow up and then we'll wrap up and then we'll, I'll okay. stay for five minutes. But uh, so one thing, you see, I'm an academic, but I also have to go now because I have to, we bought some trucks there for military, uh, for army. 
because they need to move some damn rockets for air defense. And then that's what I'm going to be doing in the next 15 minutes. So I'll have to disconnect also. Second one, you know, I you don't become a rebel or you don't become a Ukrainian, you first Ukrainian over overnight. We had 2004. Where it yes. was very peaceful. Then it was 2014, where we realized that in order to survive, we actually have to pay the price. We, we have, you know, people have to die. And so, you know, we had freedom and democracy. Unfortunately, it turns out, and we learned it the hard way, doesn't come for free. There's no transition period. At some Thank point, you. Russian people will also have to do it. Yes. Whether they realize it or not. See, you know, that's not a popular thing among Ukrainians now, what I'm going to say. But look at some of these guys who are being arrested. You know, some of the guys in Sumy, for example, they thought they were in Crimea. They behaved as if they were Crimea against the local populations. And the local population shot them. And they didn't know what was coming. But, you know, what kind of government you are, if you are sending your platoons to a foreign territory without telling them that they are in the foreign territory, yeah, you're committing them to death. So Putin is also killing Russians. Yes. And he is bombing Kharkiv and Mariupol, which is his potential. It's pro-Russian electoral base, Odessa. Exactly. So he's doing most damage to, to pro-Russian people, not Ukrainian pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western, pro-Russian. So he is actually killing his own, if so to speak. They're not his own and never been. Right. But so so that will the price for sovereignty, for freedom and democracy, unfortunately, in this part of the world, is paid in blood. And the United States and Britain and you know, Europe also paid it at some time it, it, in blood. It also, it just was a long time ago. Yes. And so, you know, either Russians have to realize that and do it. And it's unfortunate. It might take 10 years to realize. It took me 10 years to realize it between 2004 and 2014. I did not realize it. And that's why I changed my behavior. It's why I went back to Ukraine, because that's the price. Unfortunately, that's how the world is. It's very unfair to people. It's extremely unfair to people who won't see it the next day. Right. But that's the price. That's how it is. And so, you know, I also call for actions, for sanctions. And one that has not been considered is pull big four accounting firms out of Russia. Yes. Now, now pull them now. The, the, the businesses cannot be audited. What are they doing there? Deloitte, Pricewaterhouse, Ernst & Young, out. So, so this is... And you can think about many other things. So I, we're going to stop here, I think. So, Professor, I want to, can I say one thing in closing, though? Uh, yeah. First of all, it is a great honor for me to be with you all today. Uh, I want you to know that, and, I'm, and I want to do it as often as possible. Um, uh, to be with you when, at this historic moment is, a, is truly a great honor for me uh, personally. Second, I want to be in touch with both of you and others about some of the very specific things that you were just talking about, the accounting firms, the, the money managers for money overseas. We need to uh, bring light to these things. Uh, Professor, I don't think most Americans know what you just said about those accounting firms. And I can help uh, do that. I have, uh, I think I'm up to 900,000 followers on my various social media platforms. Every journalist in the world right now covering this war uh, uh, reads me. And so let's just be in touch by email about those very concrete things. And when you expose them by name, I can tell you uh, they move fast uh, and we will work together to do that. And, and I, I just need right. your help because you guys have the yeah, expertise. I don't. Our list. We'll be in touch. Thank you very last, much. I want to yeah. say one last thing, though. Yeah. One last thing. Very, it's very important to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just having this conversation with a very senior official uh, in another uh, country of NATO yesterday. Um, and I think for people abroad, because I know this is, a, we're talking to lots of people, need to understand this. The fight in Ukraine right now is not just about the freedom of Ukraine. It's about the freedom of Europe and it's about the freedom of the world. Because if Putin wins, if Putin wins, think about what that does for all autocrats around the world. Think about what it does for all Democrats around the world. They become more afraid. The autocrats become more emboldened. And it is a, it will be a cataclysmic event for the free world. 
So stop thinking about this as a fight for freedom in Ukraine. It is actually a fight for freedom for the world. Uh, and that's why we've got to do everything we can uh, to help uh, to, to hasten the victory. Because I know the victory is coming, uh, but we need to hasten the victory because we we don't we don't want to see people die. Uh, it's just that simple. It just it is clear cut. It is black and white. It is just that simple. We have to hasten the fall uh, of this horrific invasion that Putin has launched. And I'm I'm glad to be with you today. And now I have to run there. Call me. Uh, thank you very much. Please Slava Ukraina. And I'm gonna yeah. Please go ahead. And I'm gonna pitch the donation. Please on my Twitter pin tweet. We keep School of Economics fundraise, donate in all possible. It's all going for humanitarian relief or for self-defense units or for something, whatever you say. Thank you very much. Please support us. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Timothy, I think we stop here probably, right? And I have to run, you know, and you can wrap up if you want, but uh, thank sure, you for I, everyone. Okay. I'll make some closing remarks, please. Yeah. Um, right. Take care, bye-bye. So thank you very much for watching, for staying with us. Um, it was a very profound conversation. I don't want to say anything now, just not to damage what uh, has been said. Um, thank you. And please follow us. You can follow Timofey Milovanov. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, you can follow our Facebook page of Kiev School of Economics. And we will occasionally post um, announcements of these lectures. I have to say that we will have a next lecture. The next one will be on Monday at um, 9.30 um, East uh, EST, which is 4.30 PM Kiev time. Um, this conversation will be with uh, General Petrakis, uh, who is a former CIA um, director, and we will have another lecture on Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday, and we will uh, continue this marathon. So the best thing to do would be just to follow us. Unfortunately, you know, we are setting this up on the flight because our team, our communication uh, team, our designers and IT uh, department, we are all working from different uh, locations now, sometimes in cars, sometimes in shelters. That's why things are a bit, uh, could be a bit hectic, but we already put the names of all um, presenters on our webpage and we will be uh, reminding you about it uh, through our social social media. I'm putting now in the chat my Twitter, Brick uh, T. So please uh, follow me and, um, and you know, we will, we will try to structure it uh, better. And also the lectures will be published afterwards on our, on our YouTube channel. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, your support and uh, solidarity. And I will see, I hope I will see you on Monday. Uh, 4.30 Kiev uh, PM time. Bye-bye. Um, Thank you all. Slava Ukraini.